All right, boys and girls, we have here another true-to-life version of, or episode of, I should say, Beyond the Covers. In this one, we try to do a little bit of a mix-up again, you know, of different ages of books. These are all ones that I like, and uh, there's no real theme. It's just books that I like, so there you go. We're going to be looking at FF number 13, one of the great early FF stories, if you ask me. Red Ghost Story. Uh, a lot of communist overtones, undertones and overtones and undertones and overtones in this one. I never understood the difference between an undertone and an overtone. Maybe some uh, someone more educated than myself on that subject could tell me. I think it's all the same fucking thing, but whatever. Cool World, number one. This is one that I picked up from this recent haul and I read it and it's some cool stuff going on in here, man. This one's actually a prequel to the movie, so... Kind of like what they did with uh, Star Wars, I guess. I think is they did the same sort of thing with Star Wars comic. Is what happened with Cool World, where they basically sent them information about what the characters would be like in the movie, a little bit of information, and uh, basically said do what you can with it. And then classic X Men number three. All right, here we go. Starting with Cool World number one. For those of you who remember Cool World in the '90s, it was a movie that came out about a Toon Town, basically with. Uh, Oh, how could one describe it? Well, you'll see as I go through it here. But, uh, some unsavory characters. Here. Criminals and the like. And in Cool World, one of the awesome things that happens. Kind of what makes Cool World Cool World, actually, in Toontown, is uh, everything basically is alive. You know, different objects all come alive. Let's see if I can find an example here for you. Uh, okay, here we go. The telephone. Here we go. Telephone is a living thing in Cool World. So, you know, they play around with... What would the telephone's personality be? If telephones were alive. <laughs> and then, of course, most everything, for some odd reason, most of the tunes in uh, Cool World, getting focused there, have uh, attitudes, <laughs> like this cash register, who doesn't want to give up the goods at first to the only person in Cool World who's a human, Mr. Harris, live. You see that? The bills are saying, help, help. No, no, please don't take us. <laughs> uh, I always thought that was, when I was a kid, I, I just liked it. I remember I just liked it, and I didn't really think much more about it. Now I kind of, you know, I'm kind of appreciating it for how creative it is. It's very colorful, you know. Everything is very attractive to a young eye. It's eye candy. There we go with the doorknob over there. The doorknob with attitude, the lady doorknob. Ooh, taking the key in her mouth. <laughs> and then, speaking of dirty sex, dirty sexy sexy, I think this is where she comes in. Yeah. Holly. Let's see, Holly. Where are you, Miss Holly? We gotta start going through Cool World here a little quicker. Oh, there she is. You're introduced to Holly. Bada bing, bada boom. She's the hottest doodle in Cool World. That's what all the cartoons are called, or doodles. There's doodles and then there's noids. I think the noids are what they call the humans. And doodles are the cartoons. And uh, there's Holly, you know. She's she's banging. Fun artwork. Very fun artwork. Anyways, Holly uh, basically tries to take the one human, the cop you see walking around who's just holding up the cash register for money. And she tries to have sexy, sexy time with him so that she can escape to the real world by having sex with a human. The only way for a tune to really escape. You can see here she's trying to convince him. But. He 
he starts getting a little nervous and says, you know what, something doesn't feel quite right here. And he bolts. And Holly then reveals that what she tries to do in her spare time, among other things, is take humans from the while they're dreaming who slip by accident into Cool World and she tries to have sex with them before they wake up. And if she is able to finally do that, she will all of a sudden be brought into the real world. See how she's desperately trying here. You can make me real, love. I want you. I need you. Come to me. She's saying this to this ugly guy here. Interesting idea for a story. Very original idea, I would say. I like it a lot. I like the artwork a lot. You know, it's nothing classic. Uh, nothing classic yet, I guess you could say, if you want to be optimistic. But I just like it, man. I really like it. So there you go. Cool world, number one. Ooh, an ad there for the movie of Batman Returns. That's cool. Time for X-Men number three. Classic X-Men number three, that is. And, you know, I've already talked about this. So you've got the Claremont writing, Art Adams cover. And uh, continuations, basically, of these classic X-Men of original stories. This one is a continuation of the War Hunt story from X-Men number 95. For those of you who are familiar with the early Claremont run of X-Men. That is when Thunderbird dies. You know, they reprint all the original artwork. I'm skipping over that story here. Thunderbird explodes. I forget who the villain is, but on the villain's um, airplane. And they're all trying to figure out why he wouldn't listen to them. Why he wouldn't jump off the plane. Why did he have to be so stubborn? And wind up killing himself, basically. In this plane crash. And so, with that, Fiend, they carry on into the new story. This is new material. This is how they do it for the second half. With artwork that isn't my favorite, to be honest, guys. Uh, at least in the beginning here. But the story is awesome. It's basically just about all the X-Men and how they're dealing with Thunderbird's death. And, you know, Professor X is uh, struggling there. Because he was psychically linked to Thunderbird when he died, so he experienced all of his pain and is also extremely guilty. Here's Thunderbird's parents about Thunderbird. And they fill in, you know, p plots in the uh, in the story. I don't want to give away too much, but they basically add on to pieces of the original story so that you, like, learn more about Thunderbird. Not changing the original story, just adding on, filling in the pieces. Like, they had add on uh, James Proudstar here. He's supposed to be Thunderbird's brother, who's not in the original story. And here he is burning Thunderbird's body. And he declares at the end that he's going to avenge um, he's going to avenge his brother. And they also reveal here that <clears throat> Thunderbird was in the war. And they never told anybody about it. You know, lots of stuff like that. Cool little add-ons. Here he is, his brother saying, I will avenge you, brother. And then this is, of course, a reprint of the actual cover of X-Men 95, and it's all shiny, because it's on the same, on the same um, cover wrap, right? It's on the interior of the back cover wrap. So it still uh, looks like a normal cover would look, it's just on the inside. It's cool, man. You know, you get a little bit of the old mixed with a little bit of the new. And then, of course, you got these amazing back covers. On all the classic X-Men. There. That one was a little faster. I was going to try to do that one faster. I think I did. On to the goody goody. FF13. Alright, well, I look back through the video and it turns out this was just hanging on by a thread. This little piece. Right there. And it just finally came off. It was its time. Just needed one reading to come off. Sad though, huh? Messed up this otherwise perfect edge. Where there's normally tons of chips like that. Oh, man. I, that gave me a cold sweat. That was horrible. I feel, not only am I embarrassed to have done that, but I just feel fucking 
horrible, man. Love this book. Tiniest little chip like that. It's not okay with me. Okay, anyways, I'm gonna try to move ahead here to enjoy the story. You know, we got Jack Kirby doing the pencils. Ditko doing the inking. It's one of the few times that happened. Can you hear it in my voice? <laughs> How pissed I still am. Ah, uh, but that's all right. I'm going to try to show you the amazingness of this comic here. It starts off with Mr. Fantastic in his asbestos suit. Homemade, of course. Grabbing the torch. You can see that there. And then we've got some cool thing artwork, and the thing is not happy. Not so happy with Mr. Fantastic, so he stuffs him into the vial there. You know, as he would in an early FF. Love that. The early humor it makes the FF amazing. And then you get introduced to the Red Ghost, who is a Russian communist, Ivan, what's his name, Ivan Krugoff, I think. And he has his communist apes here that he trains. Look at him here. How evil does he look, huh? How evil does he look there? I like it. Very fun. And then he executes his plan as villain, which is to take his apes into space. <laughs> Such a funny story. And basically replicate what the FF did by going into space and going through the cosmic rays that gave them their powers. So we go into part two here. Uh, the Red Ghost gets his name because he's yeah, part of the Red Scare, communist, Russian era stuff, but he also can be invisible. And I believe that's why he's called the Red Ghost. They never really confirmed that, but it makes the most sense to me. Um, and he's not just invisible like the Invisible Girl, but he actually can pass through things, which is kind of interesting because it's sort of like a prelude to the vision. Not exactly the same with his power, but, you know, he can move through physical things if he wants to. Not just be invisible, which is interesting. And here you get introduced to the Watcher. First appearance of the Watcher, man. Isn't this great? All in one book. Torch is powering. A cylinder. Human jet engine. There you go. Complaining about it, too. The Red Ghost is peacing out. Said, I'm out of here, boys. How do they leave us off here? I'm trying to remember. Oh, I forgot about this. Look at this, boys and girls. How cool is this? What an ad page, huh? Now on sale. Spidey number one and TOS 39. So cool, man. What a month for Marvel. Shit. This book comes out and they're advertising TOS 39 and Amazing Spider-Man number one for next uh, for coming out. Not next month, sorry, for the same month. Isn't that nuts? What a time to be alive as a comic buyer. Oh, if only, right? It's probably something all of us say. If only. Could have been back then to buy these books. But hey, we wouldn't probably have appreciated them as much as we do now, or I wouldn't at least. I wouldn't uh, have the, the foresight to know, you know, about their importance. Sometimes things become classic over time as a result of things changing in the comics world. I would say in part that's what happened uh, with Marvel, but there was also, you know, an undeniable popularity to these books during the 60s themselves. So this was artwork that was appreciated during its own time. You know? 